As I'm sure many of you know, Hollywood is effectively shut down right now, as the writers and actors have gone on strike. The writers go to America for nearly three months, and the actors for a few weeks. The first time both parties have been on strike together in 60 years. Needless to say, this is history in the making. But quite a bit of people have been wondering where animation falls into all of this. Are they going to go on strike, or are they okay as is? And the answer is... a lot more depressing than you may initially realize. First off, the reason why the Animation Guild isn't on strike is simple. Strikes can't be on a whim. They only happen as a last resort when contracts between unions and studios are up for renewal and an agreement hasn't been settled. The AMPTP, who represents Hollywood studios and production companies, have purposely set up their contracts with TAG, SAG, and the WGA to all renew at different points in time in order to avoid all three striking in unison. Pretty evil, right? Sounds like something that would only be done if they knew a day like this would come and they wanted to stall for as long as possible. So TAG couldn't go on strike until next year. But that doesn't mean things are all sunshine and rainbows in the industry. The reality of the situation is, animation is in a pretty dire state. Both television and film. And if something doesn't change soon, the industry may never recover. This tweet, oh I mean this Z, really sums it all up. So to recap, Disney is using AI for scripts to work around the strikes, Paramount Animation is no longer developing original films, only pre-existing IPs, the Cartoon Network building officially closed, HBO is removing programs, and unemployment in the animation industry is at an insane high. I've been trying to cover everything going on in the industry for a while. As you may or may not remember, I've been working on a doc diving deep into why those in the industry need a new deal for animation. Yet, as the state of everything got worse over the past year, the more overwhelming of a task it became. That's not to say the doc won't see the light of day, just that it's become such a massive undertaking that requires so much research that I've been re-examining my approach to it. Because to be frank, every time I go to work on it, I kinda end up just freezing in place. But I don't wanna just twiddle my thumbs and ignore everything that's happening now. Because I think it's very important to raise awareness and talk about these things while they're happening. It's just that so much is happening that trying to compile even a fraction of it into a coherent, organized video felt impossible because everything that's happening is far from coherent or organized. So let's just dive headfirst into the madness and hit on as many points as possible until we're just as exhausted as the people behind the shows we adore. And the best place to start? How about the fact that everyone is unemployed? All right, maybe not everyone, but if you follow a plethora of artists or production workers in the industry on social media, odds are that most of them are either looking for work or preparing to look for work. Why? Because practically nothing is getting picked up right now at any studio. For those who don't know, animation, like the rest of entertainment, is very gig-based. Unless you're working in something like IT at a studio, your job has a set end date from day one. Which checks out, given that the project you're working on is either a TV show with a certain number of episodes, or a movie that's ideally going to get released eventually. But even that's not a guarantee anymore. Years ago, having an end date on the project didn't necessarily mean you had a countdown to unemployment hanging over your head. It used to be way more common to either have the show you were working on get renewed while you were working on it, meaning there was a good chance you'd be brought back for the following season, or the studio would do their best to keep you in their system and move you around to other projects being made there. Why do you think Adventure Time, Regular Show, Steven Universe, OKKO, OK Infinity Train, Craig of the Creek, and so many other Cartoon Network shows of the 2010s have an overlap in artist. But now, there are fewer projects being greenlit everywhere, and seasons are getting much shorter. Thus, animation jobs are becoming even more limited and much more competitive than before. And make no mistake, it was a competitive job market, but 2023 has felt really different, much more bleak, and I don't think it's a coincidence that there's a lack of projects getting greenlit after studios reached an agreement with TAG last year. It almost feels spiteful. Sure, we'll agree to slightly better working conditions. We just won't give any of you work, so you can't reap the benefits of that new deal. 
And even with the New Deal, it's clear that a lot of issues within the industry have not been resolved. For example, shows getting picked up for one big season, only for a streaming service to only release the first half of that season, label it season one, and then release the other half a year later under the disguise of a second season. The issue with this? It's just a way for studios to avoid greenlighting an actual second season, and in the process, they could avoid giving their artists raises that usually come with a second season. And on a similar note, job creep hasn't been resolved. What's job creep? Let me just give you an example. Right now, there's a lot of discourse around this incredible animatic from Invincible Season 2, an entire fight scene done by a single storyboarder that's more or less full-blown animation. Storyboards don't have to be this detailed. And as far as we know, the artist did not receive any extra compensation for going the extra mile with the sequence. Now for the artist, I'm sure this is a great way to retain your vision, to ensure what's in your head is translated perfectly into the final product. But no matter how you slice it, that's still doing the work of an animator while only being recognized as a storyboard artist. Storyboard artists nowadays have a lot of responsibilities on their plate. Responsibilities that used to belong to different job positions, like layout artists, but now those positions really don't exist because they've been absorbed into other jobs without a pay raise. And while I'm sure that kind of work ethic is appreciated, the popular opinion from storyboard artists is that it shouldn't be normalized. And keep in mind, most animation jobs require you to live in LA. Most entertainment jobs do in general. Which is why anyone bitching about the strike looks so fucking dumb. Saying these actors, writers, and artists are already making a lot. Like, do you know how expensive California is? I've been living here for a year. It's fucking expensive, my guy. They don't have a choice but to be here for their career. So imagine how stressful it is to go without work for months in one of the most expensive places in the country, but still dropping thousands of dollars a month on bills because the studios that are already forcing you to live out here won't greenlight anything for you to work on. No matter how you slice it, that's messed up. Not to mention the amount of things that do get greenlit, but are produced internationally. Looking at you, Warner Bros. Discovery. And lest we forget, residuals aren't really a thing anymore. At least not something to help people survive while looking for a job. And for the animation go to particular, residuals help pay for healthcare. Better residuals in the age of streaming is one of the many things they're fighting for. And it's not just the people making the cartoons that are suffering. The projects are also taking a hit. Everyone's complaining that TV's getting worse. And yeah, it's easy to blame the writers. But use your head. It's common knowledge that TV shows and movies are rushed out the door nowadays. Writers' rooms are much smaller, and they're given way less time to let these projects cook in the oven. If you're watching this and you have a job, how would you feel about being forced to complete your task in half the time you were given before at either the same pay or less? And all the while, the CEO spearheading these changes are pocketing millions a year. Unfathomable amounts of money. You wouldn't be too happy, wouldn't you? So practice some basic fucking empathy. That being said, adult animation really seems to be the only side of the industry that's remotely doing okay right now, putting out projects that people seem excited for. But on the kids' side, things feel… dry? I think a big reason why is that for the first time since 2010-2012, we don't have a big serialized cartoon for people of all ages to latch onto that isn't based off a pre-existing property. Moon Girl, you deserve so much better. And I'm sorry that being tied to the Marvel brand has caused a lot of people to write you off without giving you a fair shake. This isn't just speculation, by the way. I know a lot of people who love animation and acknowledge that Moon Girl looks gorgeous and seems like a really good time, but has trouble giving it a shot solely because it's a Marvel property and superhero fatigue did catch up to the general audience. Honestly though, even before superhero fatigue, I can't say the crowd that watched Gravity Falls and Star vs. The Forces of Evil back in the day was super into any of the Marvel shows, even though pretty much all of them were serialized. I mean, take a look at the Disney TVA social media for example. They used to average about a thousand likes when Owl House and Amphibia were airing, but now that both of them are over, most of their posts barely go above 200 likes. And the ones that do, surprise, surprise, either pander to nostalgia or are about Owl House and Amphibia. You're falling off. 
That being said, please check out Moon Girl, y'all. It's far from your average Marvel outing. And if it gets canceled, I don't know the next time we're going to get a show that manages to not only look this good, but tells the kind of intimate stories that it does. But without a big original show that releases gradually, like Gravity Falls, Steven Universe, Owl House, Amphibia, etc., I think there's a genuine lack of interest in Western animation at the moment. People are flocking to anime, and I can't blame them. These story-driven cartoons tend to get people engaged in animation and seek out more shows like it in the medium, but in the process, they get exposed to a bunch of other shows they wouldn't have given the chance otherwise. I can personally attest that if it wasn't for Owl House or Amphibia, I never would have watched Big City Greens over quarantine, and now I think that's one of the funniest Disney Channel shows ever made, period. In an age where we're barely getting new shows, the ones that are rolling out from the top dogs like Nick, Cartoon Network, R.I.P. Studios, or Disney don't have that all-ages appeal. They're just skewing younger and younger. And that in itself isn't a problem. Kids obviously deserve their own programming tailored to them. But kids nowadays don't even actively watch TV. They watch TikTok and streamers and Coco Melon. Oh my god, that's so terrifying. Part of the reason Cartoon Network is losing more time to Adult Swim is due to more adults watching the network than children. To quote Deadline, adults have gravitated to the network in early fringe, well before the previous 8pm start to Adult Swim. From 6pm to 8pm, 68% of Cartoon Network's viewers were over the age of 18. HBO Max data is kept closer to the vest, but Adult Swim and Cartoon Network are set to be foundational elements in the rebranded service. Yeah, we'll see about that, given that it keeps purging content from the platform. New programs skewing younger is a huge mistake because historically, teens and adults have always tuned into these channels for the shows that appeal to them too. Whether that's turning off their brain with some Spongebob, being moved to tears with Avatar, or a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B with shows like Steven Universe. And these are the people that are going to show up to conventions with their squad or their kids, dressed up as the characters from the shows they adore. Like, no disrespect at all. But you're just not gonna get that same level of passion from shows like Kiff or Haley's on it. I'm sure they're fine shows, and I'm sure there'll be Kiff cosplay to make me eat my words. But I feel like these shows are not gonna appeal to an older crowd at all. And hey, psst, kids like things that skew older, because they feel cooler watching it. Which is why, serialization or not, these cartoons should be allowed to get their edge back. Standards and practices have cracked down so much that getting something like Cartoon Network's 2010 catalog made today feels impossible. And speaking of Cartoon Network... Over the past year, the future of Cartoon Network has been a topic that's come up quite a bit by animation fans and people who work in the industry. I've covered this topic in numerous videos, but I think a lot of people are either confused or just think the notion of Cartoon Network going under is fear-mongering for YouTube clicks. And I can see where that idea is coming from. Last year, when it was first made known that the days of Cartoon Network Studios were numbered, things quickly turned into a game of telephone, and people thought Cartoon Network as a channel was going under. The story actually got pretty big to the point where it was making rounds on not just Twitter and TikTok, but Instagram and Facebook. So Cartoon Network had to say something. So they issued a statement along the lines of, hey, we're not dead, we're actually celebrating our birthday. But it was the first milestone anniversary in 10 years that didn't have an animated music video commission for it. So uh, that was already pretty telling. And because the brand itself came forward to clear the air, I think a lot of people disregarded any further information about what was happening behind the scenes because Cartoon Network themselves said they're fine. It's not like brands have ever done damage control or anything. I doubt Cartoon Network as a channel or a brand will ever be going anywhere because it holds too much value to get rid of entirely. But like, that doesn't detract from the fact that they lost their studio, with a ton of projects we've never even heard about cancelled or in limbo, moved two new series to Adult Swim, although one was being made at WBA, it was still gonna premiere on Cartoon Network, Adult Swim itself starting at 5pm as of this August, and aside from Invincible Fight Girl, most of their current or upcoming programming are reboots or revivals of popular IP. To quote the legend ENJQ, the building rules, but we're not just sad about the building itself. We're mourning Cartoon Network Studios being a unique entity. There will be no more CNS, and things will be different. 
It's not as simple as just moving people into a new building, I'm afraid. This is the loss of a unique studio culture. That said, good work can be done anywhere, and I'm hopeful that many of these good people will still be able to make good cartoons at WBA. You may remember a studio by the name of Anna Barbera. They made a ton of iconic cartoons like The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, and The Jetsons. I wonder what happened to them. Oh, they ultimately got absorbed into Warner Bros. Animation, being only used for marketing and trademark purposes. Hmm, I wonder how Cartoon Network getting absorbed into Warner Bros. animation could possibly end. Guys, it's Jover, and instead of denying it, we should at least be talking about it. Because the more awareness we spread, and the more consumers are made aware of what's happening, the bigger of a chance there is that something can change. I don't think we can get this building back, but maybe what's left of Cartoon Network Studios can hold on to its independence and creativity. <laughs> This is Cartoon Network's current and upcoming slate. Adventure Time, Fiona and Cake, Craig of the Creek, The Amazing World of Gumball Revival, Teen Titans Go, Wee Baby Bears, Looney Tunes cartoons, Jessica's Little Big World, Ianu Child of Wonder, Invincible Fight Girl, The Powerpuff Girls reboot, and The Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends reboot. Only two of these upcoming shows are original series, and they're definitely not long for this world. Fucking incredible stuff, guys. And by incredible, I mean incredibly depressing. I'm not gonna act like I'm not excited to see more Gumball, or that the idea of a serialized Powerpuff Girls show from Craig McCracken himself doesn't pique my curiosity, but it sucks to see Cartoon Network conform to the same path Nickelodeon went down years ago, and only rely on the shows they know are safe and profitable, rather than experiment with new ideas. SpongeBob, Loud House, Casa Grandes, The Patrick Star Show, Camp Coral, The Rugrats reboot, Big Nate, based off a comic strip, the upcoming Fairly Odd Parents reboot, Smurfs, all the Avatar Studios projects. Is this not a little depressing? Recently, the head of Paramount and Nickelodeon, Brian Robbins, denounced the idea of original animated movies, and instead wants to only focus on movies based off popular animated series. You know, like a bajillion more SpongeBob and Avatar movies. Sorry, Avatar, I'm excited to have you back, I really am, but you have to be thrown under the bus for this one because they are going to milk you dry. We're not going to release an expensive original animated movie and just pray people will come, Robbins said. Just absolute insanity. Now, the president of Paramount Animation, Ramsey Natio, did a bit of damage control in the following interview, and if this doesn't demonstrate the disconnect between the people at the top and the people actually responsible for making animation, I don't know what is. We are absolutely committed to making original animated films and are in development on a handful of projects. Brian and I believe we are nothing without fresh voices, faces, and narratives, and it's our responsibility to add new perspectives, modern characters, and vernacular to our culture of storytelling. Yo, they're gonna say we're in the Nick movie. Originals speak authentically to today's audience and must be handled with care and make their own mark in our legacy library and hopefully stand the test of time. That said, we're not a one-size-fits-all kind of studio, and our budgets are designed to support the scope of our storytelling. We'll see whose words end up aligning with the actions of the studio, but one thing I need these big wigs to remember is that every successful franchise started out as an original idea. Toy Story didn't spawn in with four movies generating a bajillion dollars. It started out as one movie that did well enough to get a sequel, that did better than the first, and eventually a third and fourth that did really good in the box office. And even then, they made a bunch of other original ideas in between all of those films. Some hits, some flops. That's just the nature of the industry. You can't have hit after hit every time. But that's not a reason to abandon original ideas. Just because one original idea kinda flopped doesn't mean the others will. Because all you're really doing by greenlighting popular IP after popular IP is making sure that people get tired of those IPs. And I can't say I want that either. I want beloved characters to remain beloved, but I want you to make room for new characters and new stories as well. That's what I think most people want. It's exhausting seeing a new show come around knowing that it's the kind of game changer for animation people have been looking for, but also knowing that it's not going to last more than a season or two due to a lack of support from the platform hosting it. What's happening right now is the result of these corporations getting way too ahead of themselves, ditching cable, riding the streaming wave, trying to mimic what's popular, while cutting costs and throwing talent to the side, only to find out that none of that was sustainable. 
Now they just want to rush out anything that's proven to make a quick buck. Now they want to remove content from streaming services to evade paying royalties. Now they want to do whatever it takes to keep them rich without taking into consideration the creatives or the consumers. And if you don't care about either of us, then what the fuck are we doing here? Everyone's being punished. The people behind the scenes pouring their entire being into a project, and the fans who were once so fond of their work. Everyone is jaded, everyone is desensitized, and everyone is tired. I'm scared. I really am. Especially for animation. Just like three years ago when productions had to shut down due to COVID, animation is the first thing these higher-ups turn to to exploit when things in the entertainment industry are starting to look a little shaky. And just like three years ago, animation will be the first thing they toss to the side when it's time to save money. But they will continue to feed their investors and their consumers lies that everything is doing great and that they really value animation, even though their current slate clearly shows that they don't. And their insistence to implement AI into the process is only driving a bigger wedge between creatives and executives. We don't need AI anywhere near this industry. AI is inhuman. It, by design, goes against everything that makes art special. And make no mistake, content is art. We may all have started calling it content, but that was just another tactic by these multi-millionaires to further devalue the craft and try to make us more willing to accept any schlock they try to feed us. Things won't ever be the same after this strike, and after everything's said and done, I just don't know if people will be willing to work with these overpaid, ego-inflated CEOs who have shown their true colors time and time again. Because all they care about is their bottom dollar, to continue to have all the money in the world and share that money with no one, even the people making the projects that got them there in the first place the people who are struggling just to make ends meet. I really need you guys to understand that most writers, actors, and artists are working class citizens living in the most expensive cities in the world because that's simply where their jobs are located. And with animation, the most undervalued medium in entertainment, studios will try to get away with paying them as little as possible compared to their peers. But we can't forget that it's always darkest just before dawn. Across all of entertainment, we're seeing the rise in independent projects. Live action projects like Snot Girl or The Comic Shop, and of course animated projects like Hell of a Boss, Far Fetched, Murder Drones, and of course Lackadaisy. Which, while making this video, hit its million dollar stretch goal, funding five full length episodes for season one. A million dollars in under a week, absolutely incredible stuff, and proof that these big corporations aren't needed to bring your passions to life. And this is just the tip of the indie iceberg. Creatives are fighting back with everything they got, and I'm hoping that these projects give creatives the leverage needed against executives to create even more fresh and original ideas under much better working conditions on wages they can comfortably live with. I want to see reboots return to being the outliers, not the norm. This video didn't go nearly as in-depth as I want it to. As I said in the intro, I want the big doc to really lay everything out on the table. But for now, I hope you guys have a slightly better understanding of what's going on in the industry. Shit's fucked. And right now, the best way to make a change, in my opinion, is to spread as much awareness as possible about what's going on and support these indie projects. So, I'll be linking some resources related to the Animation Guild, the WGA and SAG Strikes, and some indie projects worth checking out in the description down below. If this video was informative by any means, then please, give it a like and subscribe to the roundtable with notifications on. It'd really go a long way. And if you really want to make my day, then how about giving me a follow on Twitter and Instagram at AustricFox. The roundtable also has a Patreon that I've been meaning to revive with sneak peeks into upcoming videos and projects, like the cartoon idea we've been cooking up, so check that out if you want to go the extra mile, but no pressure at all. I understand money's been real funny for a lot of people lately. With all this being said, I've been Kev, aka AustricVox, and I'll see you guys later. Animation forever. Peace.